Whatever chapter that is. Yeah. <laughs> the final chapter of James. Final chapter of James. I think you can look at your hand and you can tell. How many? James chapter 5. Yeah, James chapter 5. Somebody give her a 5. <laughs> so James 5, as we continue to be blessed by this book, the little, the little letter of James, though it's small, it's only five chapters, it's heavy hitting. It's, he doesn't mess around. Um, and re really the first part of this, we'll, we'll kind of see a little more of that from, from James. Um, but uh, I think it is important to highlight that, that last, and we did talk a lot about it, it was the title of the message that came from um, verse 15 of chapter 4 last week. Uh, and I think it's worth repeating and worth reviewing. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Because <laughs> um, a lot of times we can get in our own planning. Um, nothing wrong with planning. But it should always have that instruction there from James chapter 4, verse 15. If the Lord will. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, he goes on to say that, doesn't he? And we don't, none of us do. And so, letting the Lord decide and, and knowing that the Lord's will comes first. Before my own, before anybody, before anything. Um, and so... Here in chapter 5, he's going to hit again with what we, we looked a little bit at this in chapter 3, um, at the, the rich man that walks in with the fine apparel, remember, and we say you have the good seat, and the other poor fellow in rags could sit on the floor or have the, the bad seat. He comes back to this whole idea of the rich, um, especially here in these first few sections. Um, in these first few verses, I mean. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. So, just those first three verses, you can see how heavy hitting he is against those that would kind of, it's called ill-gotten gain, where you're making riches and it's off of another person's poverty. People robbing the poor so that they can get richer. That's what's being addressed here. Don't think of anyone that's rich as evil. Um, it's how they got their riches. Here, That's what James is highlighting. In fact, Jeremiah, when we study that on Sunday nights, we see a little bit of this, how those who rob the poor, those who abuse the poor to get further in life, it's a shame. Judgment is awaiting. And that's the idea here. And they're robbing their, themselves of such spiritual blessings when you do this. Careful. You know, it says, go to now, you rich men. But you could really say, careful, <laughs> rich people. Don't let your riches control your life. Don't let your riches um, corrupt you. That's what's happened uh, in verse 2. Your riches are corrupted. All of your clothing, your garments, your, uh, everything that you hold so true and so uh, dear uh, are moth-eaten. They're, they're rusting. They're fading away. And yet they devour you like a fire. You're passionate about it. You're willing to do anything to get it. You know? And... It's always a good idea to take a trip to the dump and look and see at all the stuff there around the dump. 
and understand every single possession, every single item will end up there one day. It is. It's a good thing. You, you see those cars that drive by on the freeway, they're hauling all these smushed cars and they're taking them away. Just think, at one time, someone was really, that was the treasure of someone's heart. Boy, if I could just get that car, polishing it, washing it, and they, they we, it's good for us to understand it's not going to last forever. None of this. That's why we sang that first song. All I know is this is not my home. I'm just passing through. Take this world and the cars and the, you know, you fill in the blank. There's plenty of things that we can get into. Um, hobbies and things we like to do. And, and we say we have this, but oftentimes it's that thing that has us. <laughs> you know, um, it's so... It's so just good for us to hear these words. Um, and behold, verse 4, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields. They've done all the work, which is of you kept back by fraud. That's the money that you owe them, you keep it back. Uh, it cries, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, or the Lord of hosts. Ye have lived in pleasure and the earth, on the earth, and been wanton, and ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he does not resist you. So it's, it's again this harsher warning, understanding there's a deeper thing. There's something that may not be seen on the surface of how you're getting your riches. What, what it is that makes you go further. It's causing the workers that really deserve to get further, really deserve to have more, you're keeping back from them. And it's, you know, the cries that enter into the ears. It makes me think of Cain and Abel. When Cain killed his brother Abel, the Lord came to him, right, and said, where's your brother Abel? And he's, those famous words, am I my brother's keeper? And that blood was crying out to God. Only God could hear that blood crying out. Did you know? Blood speaks. And in the same way here, robbing the poor... And not giving someone what they deserve when it's in your hand to give it. The Proverbs has a, a harsh warning about that. You know, you don't, you don't share it when it's in your hand, it's in your store to give. You, you're holding it back, hoarding. In fact, the word hoarding, it's not true hoarding if, if it's not robbing. The only, the, the, that word has been tainted. Hoarding is robbing others from having what they should have. And you're, you're just stacking up, you know, I think of people that are storing and they have, you know, remember Y2K? And people just filling up their, their pantries with just all kinds of things. That's the idea. And no one else, you know, can have it when it's, when it's time for it. Now in America, we have no shortage. So it's hard for us to understand that. So, they, you know, we really weren't taken away from the food supply. In our nation, it's, it's sickening how our food supply is, is uh, well beyond our means. It's, it's well... Uh, anyways, that whole idea, though, uh, and the word hoarding really is keeping something when it rightfully should be dispersed. It right, right, rightfully should be kind of uh, measured out between... Plenty of people, uh, well, the community. So, that's the whole idea. You have these workers in a field that you've hired. You say, I've never hired anyone. I'm not, I'm not a boss. Well, if you pay any bill whatsoever, they expect payment. In a way, you, you are hiring that person to cause your cell phone to work. You're hiring that person to cause your cable network to come on, whatever it is. 
So we, we all could be in this boat. And, we, and the whole idea is you're not to hold back, you're not to, to keep for yourself that which rightfully belongs to whoever it is. So it's just right living and using wisdom. But with all that said, nothing wrong with rich people. There's nothing wrong with being rich. It's the whole idea is the in, in what James here in these first six verses that we read, he's pointing out how you're using your money. Money is neutral. Money can be used for a whole lot of good, and it can be used a whole lot of evil. And so we have to be careful, and I can't help but remind us that the writer of this was technically the half-brother of Jesus Christ, but your riches are corrupt, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and so <coughs> It sounds a lot like Matthew chapter 6, and we have to, have to turn over there. But his brother, his half-brother, Jesus, who said that. And so it's kind of neat when you go through James, and you understand he wasn't a believer, but he remembers these teachings. <coughs> and so he eventually, uh, after Jesus was risen from the dead, of course, uh, James came to to know him to know the Lord and, and God was born again. But in Matthew six verse nineteen, Jesus says, "Lay not up for yourselves treasure treasures on earth, where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break in." And he, he goes on. We we you know Matthew six nineteen should be jotted there next to verse 2 of James 5, just because it, it should remind us of that. And James knew what Jesus taught. It's kind of, it, it's neat. So verse 7, Be patient, therefore, <clears throat> back to James 5, verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waits for the precious fruit of the earth, or the the uh, gardener, the, the one that tills the ground, that's, he's waiting for the fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the earthly and latter rain. So you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near, draws nigh. The coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord. It should be on our minds. Always. And we're patient. It teaches us patience, doesn't it? Don't be in such a hurry. Be patient. And let the Lord... It's kind of in that same... Uh, same area of last week, if the Lord will. It's if, if I can get to that appointment, fine. If not, if the Lord will. Be patient. I remember that at the Bible college, people could not wait to get married. I mean, literally. They could not wait. And some of them went and got married. And it was a disaster. <laughs> because you didn't know each other. And it was kind of like, what's the rush? Get to know each other. <laughs> Love is first off, what? 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is patient. It's not in a hurry. In fact, Sunday morning, if you come, we'll touch a lot more on this. On Sunday morning. Because it, it really is... <clears throat> Love is patient. Love is to be waiting. You can, <laughs> you, you're not in a hurry. So too, be patient. The Lord's the, the rain will come, the fruit will come, but you have to be patient. <laughs> so grudge not one against another. Don't hold grudges against another, brethren. Again, this is to the church. I have to remind myself that of that. He's writing to Christians in the church. And we hold grudges against one another. 
We should be. It says, grudge not against each other. Lest ye be condemned, behold, speaking of the Lord's coming, the judge stands before the door. In fact, Jesus, in Revelation, Jesus is at the door, knocking, right? If anyone hears my voice, doesn't anyone, is anyone in there? And he's on the door of a church, asking that question. So take my brethren, verse 10 goes on, take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. There it is again. Behold, we count them happy, or blessed, which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job, I hope you have. Talk about a patient man. (laughs) And have seen the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful. He shows pity. He's merciful. And of tender mercy. The Lord's not in a hurry. Obviously. He hasn't come back yet. Kind of makes a lot of us a little antsy. (laughs) Come on, Lord. What, What are you waiting for? He's teaching us, isn't he? Yeah. The Lord is patient. He's he's shows mercy. He's he has pity on the people that we despise. We say send them to hell, and the Lord says, "I have pity." That's the whole idea of that. The Lord is not a man that he should repent or that he should relent or uh, change his mind. Right? He knows. He knows when he's coming. <laughs> And he knows who's who are his. Right? Follow up. We don't. <laughs> we don't know when the Lord is coming. We don't know who belongs to the Lord. We don't know who doesn't belong to the Lord. Keep that in mind. <laughs> because too many have the uh, God conscience. <laughs> you know. They start to think they know, and they themselves know things that only God truly knows. So, above all though, verse 12, but above all things, my brethren, swear not by heaven, uh, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, lest ye fall into condemnation. And the devil will use vows. You are never, ever instructed in the Bible. The Bible never instructs any one of us, ever, to take a vow. And yet we do it, don't we? We'll swear by heaven, swear by earth. We promise, that's the word we use. I promise I'll be there. I promise I'll show up. I promise I do this, that, or the other. And because we're human, because we're sinners... We fail. So the whole idea of that, again, he learned this from his brother, too. (laughs) Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Don't be giving people your word, thinking that it's such a big thing, that, oh, I've given you my word. No. (laughs) You have no idea what tomorrow holds. Making promises and then you end up breaking them. And how we fall into condemnation is when those promises are broken, the enemy is right there to say, who do you think you are? Some Christian you are. Some representation of God that you just did. And we're condemned. We're condemned because we didn't hold up our end of the bargain. I always have to remind Myself, we should always be reminded of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Abraham couldn't hold up that end of the covenant. The the uh, that the land that his his um, his offspring it would be like the stars in the sky, the sand of the sea. God had made this covenant. What happened? God knew Abraham could not hold this covenant and and keep the promise. So he puts Abraham into a deep sleep. Abraham's sleeping, snoozing, as God passes through the dead carcass, which that's how they did it back in ancient times. 
they made this, they, they used to call it cut covenant. They would cut this animal in two and split it open and basically walk through and this, this uh, furnace, this torch, basically went through those two and it was representation of our God who is a consuming fire. He's a torch. And He basically makes this covenant. <laughs> and uh, it's perfect because Abraham, like us, <laughs> we can rest. Because we're, we're not obligated... <laughs> To hold up that end of the covenant. It's all God. So, again, be careful with oaths and covenants and promises and all of these things. Again, we can fall into temptation, uh, condemnation rather. And patience, patience, patience. How can we learn about patience? Give me <laughs> The title of the message. And get married right away. <laughs> no, the, the, the answer to that question, how do I learn about patience, is in verse 13, and it's the title of our message tonight. It comes from this last section, 13 through the end. Is any among you afflicted or in pain? <laughs> Let him pray. There it is. <laughs> is any merry or happy? We... I hope some of you are, because we just got finished singing. <laughs> Let him sing psalms. Verse 14, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders. Don't stay home. Call for the elders of the church, and let them what? Pray. Pray. Reminds me of Jesus who touched lepers. We would look and say, that's so foolish. Use your brain. You're going to catch leprosy. You're going to catch some ugly disease. But Jesus Christ shows us a little bit of something we all lack, and that's faith. And this whole area of prayer, we love to stay home, away from people, and pray. <laughs> but God, what, what James, the whole idea here is the church setting. Call for the elders. Have them come and lay hands. Why? Because that's where the power is. There's power in prayer. When we have someone lay hands on us, it's simply just imparting that blessing and knowing there are more than two people here. Because where two or more are gathered in His name, He's here. So let Him call for the elders. Let them pray over Him. Anointing Him with oil. And we'll, we do that. We do that today. We anoint people with oil. I don't always have it on hand, but I should. <laughs> but really the whole idea of oil, what is an oil a representation of? Uh, the Holy Spirit. Oh. So praying, asking for the Spirit. The physical oil, that can work. That's neat. But the important thing is what it represents, and that's... The Holy Spirit is there. The Holy Spirit is in this prayer. It's not just my feelings and my desires and what I want to happen, when I want it to happen, but it's, it's the Spirit. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Ask the paralytic, the guy that was lowered down to the, remember that? The story of Jesus in the, in the house. His friends wanted to get this guy, he's paralyzed, he's on a bed, he can't walk, he can't do nothing, and they lower him down through the roof and right in front of Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says something that I'm sure all his friends' jaws dropped. And said, that's not why we brought him to you. Because Jesus looks and says, your sins are forgiven. And they go, okay. And he, Jesus, of course, the master that he is, he uses that whole thing as an illustration for the ones watching. He says, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or rise up and walk and do this physical. The whole thing there is, is it the spiritual thing that's more important? Or is it the physical? 
Not necessarily. We, we always right away go to, I don't know, what is easier? It's easy to say your sins are forgiven, but your sins really won't be forgiven if they're from some man, which, by the way, that's why the Pharisees freaked out. Because they, they knew, and it's true, only God can forgive sin. And to say your sin forgive, your sin is forgiven, you're claiming to be God. Wow. Right there in that story. Wow. Wow. So, this whole idea of physical healing and spiritual healing, we need to understand it's the spiritual he healing because oftentimes the physical illness, the physical thing that's going on, whatever it may be, you don't know how the Lord might be using that. As, as awful as it could be, whatever physical sickness or ailment it may be, the Lord could be using that. And so that's why every time we pray, and if they're, if they're true elders, they will lay hands and say, if it's the Lord's will, touch and heal. If it's the Lord's will. Because I don't want to get in between, get in the middle of what you're doing, Lord. <laughs> if this is something, because the spiritual healing is the most important. So it's so good for us to keep that in mind. Confess your faults one to another. And pray. There it is again. For one another. Pray for one another. That you might be healed. For the effectual prayer, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It accomplishes a whole lot. That's what that means. We don't think prayer does much. In fact, we, we do not spend enough time praying. We never do. In our in, in just in everyday life, whatever it may be, we can always spend more time praying than we do. And I'm I'm right there in my in that boat. It, it, nobody's got this all squared down and pegged, and it, it it's it's something we all can do. And even the fact that we pray, how effective is your prayers? Are you really going? to war on your knees? Are you spending that time weeping? <laughs> Perhaps agonizing? Really struggling with what you're praying for and who you're praying for? Whatever it may be. Be a man, be a woman of prayer who knows how to pray. It's always, it, it, it really is, this is where the power is. The power of prayer. You could have Bible studies all night. You could, you could memorize every verse in the Bible. But when it comes down to it, you're the one who talks to the Lord. No one can talk to the Lord for you. And you don't just recite prayer. I hope you don't. <laughs> I mean, we have prayers with our little guys that learn the Scriptures and, and things to pray. And it is really adorable when they get to know it and memorize it. But you need to mature from that. Go beyond that where you're just talking to the Lord. And you're telling the Lord the needs as well as praising Him for what He's accomplished, for what He's done. Take Elijah, verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to like passions, just like you are, just like we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. <laughs> and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So, controlling the weather. Can anyone control the weather? <laughs> Only God. And Elijah proved it. If you were to ask Elijah, wow, Elijah, you made it rain, and then you made it stop raining. He would say, no, I didn't. God did it. <laughs> I just tapped into the, the real weatherman. He's, he's the one that controls those things. We have no control over it. And so prayer, it shows us the power that prayer truly has. The, fact, the, the, the sad part is, is many of us don't believe it. Because if we did... 
we'd be spending a whole lot more time praying. And so we have a hard time believing the Old Testament stories of Elijah, praying that it would, that it would rain, that it would stop raining. But God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Brethren, if, you, if any of you err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death. I love this. And he hides a multitude of sins. See, the enemy, Satan, demons, who are very real, by the way, they rejoice in sin. In fact, they, they make money, and they, they, man, they really get a kick out of other people's sins. And they really magnify other people's sins. They really want to hone in on other people's sins. But this idea here, when you pray for someone, when you really, really pray for someone, you're desiring that they spend eternity in heaven and not in hell. You're desiring that they, they're converted, as James says. And the sin that gets confessed or whatever, it's just covered over. It's kind of glazed over. It's whatever. What's, what's sin? It's taken care of, isn't it? Once our souls are saved from death, because the wages of sin is death. But the enemy will always be there to bring some sin back up, to fish it out of the sea of forgetfulness. And God says, and we should say too, it's forgotten. That sin has been dealt with on the cross. And I love it because no matter how much you pray, as a man, just like Elijah, you're going to err in your ways. You're going to have a fault. <laughs> you're going to fall. And so it's kind of neat the way he ends that. You know, what, Lest you think and start to say, oh, I, I can really become a man of prayer, a person that just is, is really spending time with the Lord, and I'll never sin again. I won't have anything to confess. I won't. No. James, make sure he covers that as well. <laughs> Keep in mind, if any of you have a fault or error from the truth, you rejoice. And again, the idea of saving someone from, from death. Saving someone from death. It's, we need more uh, passion. For the lost. Speaking of the rich, you know, I wanted to end this study because it goes right along with it. But you guys have probably heard this. And if not, you can have a, an abbreviated version. But the whole idea of rich and poor, we just sang from the greatest to the least, let the weak say, I am. Strong, let the poor say I am rich. It's the kingdom of heaven. That's what this is like. See, the world that we live in, everything we, we look at, we can tangibly see, and, and we see people succeed, quote unquote. They have their, their great success. Is it really success? Because it seems to be kind of this great, well, when we get to heaven, there's going to be this great switcheroo where the weak is strong, where the poor are rich. How can I say that? Well, Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in, clothed in beautiful purple and fine linen. And there was a certain beggar whose name was Lazarus. You guys heard this one? Lazarus was a beggar which laid at the rich man's gate and he was full of sores. He was poor. He was a beggar. He desired to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. 
and the dogs came and licked his sores, just to give you a visual. Verse 22, it came to pass that the beggar died. The beggar died and was carried away to heaven. Actually carried away into Abraham's bosom. That's important for other reasons we won't really get into. There's a whole study there. But Abraham's bosom is kind of uh, before Jesus died and rose again. and Heaven was open to everyone. There was this place, Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, though. After the beggar died, the rich man died, and it says he was buried. The rich man was buried. And in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes, and he was tormented, and he saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus there in his bosom, Abraham's bosom, this place. And he, carried, he cried out and said, Father Abraham, had many sons, and many sons had... Oh, no. Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, that he might dip the tip of his finger in water, just to cool my tongue for a second. For I am tormented in this flame. Verse 25. This is, Jesus is telling this real story. This really happened. But Abraham said, Son... Remember that when you were living in your lifetime, you received good things. Likewise, Lazarus received evil things. And now he is comforted, and you're in torment. And beside all this, between us, there's this great gulf that's fixed. So that they would, they would, that would want to go from that side to this side can't. Well, then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that you would send someone to my father's house, for I have five brothers, and that he might just tell them, lest they also come to this terrible place of torment. And Abraham said, they have Moses, they have the prophets. In other words, they have the Bible. Let them hear that. Verse 30, And he said, No, Father Abraham, but even if one went unto them from the dead, surely they would repent. This is so. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And the, the pun in that story, the interesting the irony, I guess, is the right word, is that Lazarus was risen from the dead. A different Lazarus, not this beggar. The other thing to note about that story is nobody has any idea what the rich man's name is. Isn't that cool? He's just some rich man. But we all know, and for thousands of years, Christians who have studied God's Word know Lazarus. As the poor man. And we're going to all meet him one day. He's in heaven. The rich man ain't. <laughs> and that whole little story, that snapshot, is just powerful because it does stir us, it should stir in us that desire to share, to get as many people away from that place of torment. Just hell. We cannot imagine. But Luke 16 there gives you just this glimpse, doesn't it, into that. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it doesn't matter how much money we have or how much money we don't have. Lord, you are so good and so faithful to just speak to our hearts. And I pray we would, each and every one of us would understand a little more about the power of prayer. Lord, even tonight as we're together, give us and put on our hearts things that we can lift up to you. Lord, as we sing these last few songs, I pray that we would take some time to pray. In Jesus' name.